Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session Mobility Data, Use Cases, and Return on Investment. Uh, I'm Elizabeth. I'm the Deputy Executive Director at Mobility Data. And I'm surrounded by two great persons, Bibiana and Lauren. Please uh, welcome uh, on the stage. Bibiana, do you want to start by presenting yourself? Um, Bibiana McHugh from TriMet um, in Portland, Oregon. Um, I've been at TriMet for over 25 years and um, um, very, very happy to be here and, and honored to be talking about data. Welcome. Uh, hello, my name is Lauren Grabowski. I'm a solutions engineer with Swiftly. Um, I've been at Swiftly for maybe just a year and a half, but I have been in planning and transit for over a decade, um, most recently at LA Metro before joining Swiftly. So I have some of that public agency background as well. So we wanted to have that um, feeling that we're around a fire pit. So please, if you have any question at any moment, don't hesitate, ask your, uh, raise your hand and ask your question. All right, time to get started. Um, uh, as we mentioned, I'm Lauren Grabowski. I work with Swiftly. I'm a solutions engineer. Um, so what does that mean? Um, hilariously enough, um, my, the topic for this session is pretty much my job description. I have an awesome job. I get to speak with transit agency staff every day and talk with them about the ROI on having access to um, accessible and accurate real-time and historical data. And so I work with them to come up with, you know, what is the value, what is the data that will best fit your most urgent needs. So Swiftly is the leading big data platform in transit. It's used by over 110 agencies now, and we're adding new agencies every single day. Uh, we work with small agencies, big agencies, um, agencies as small as two buses. We have, um, I don't know if anyone knows Catalina Island and Avalon. We, they're one of our customers who use two buses for real-time information. Um, I just worked with an agency to bring them on board into Swiftly, and they only have three vehicles in rural Wyoming. Um, and then we also work with very large agencies like SEPTA in Philadelphia, LA Metro, and most recently, MARTA in Atlanta will be joining us. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we provide both real-time and historical data, and we are a software as a service. So we do cloud-based computing, but no hardware. We are hardware agnostic, and so we work by integrating with existing hardware um, or just um, any kind of off-the-shelf hardware that an agency wishes to buy, um, which leads to a much faster implementation process and, again, just um, a lot more flexibility in uh, what can be on the bus. So how does Swiftly work? This is a <laughs> nice little complicated <laughs> diagram for you. Um, on the far left, what we're showing is basically the essence of Swiftly. All that you really need is that static schedule in real-time vehicle, like, vehicle location data. With those two inputs, that is enough data to provide real-time information and collect historical data. We do have the ability to take in additional um, inputs, such as passenger counters, um, and then we take all this information and we have the ability to do a whole lot with it. Um, and what we do with it, again, depends on the agency's needs, um, but this can include providing those real-time passenger predictions, we can put out service adjustments to cancel trips in real time. Um, we can also put out rider alerts that all get updated into the GTFSRT. Um, and all this information has the ability to flow out into different endpoints. So that GTFSRT we make, um, Swiftly's feeds go into Transit App, Google Maps, MoveIt, um, and other endpoints. Um, also SMS IVR, and we can push our rider alerts out onto Twitter. And so, you know, we're not the only <laughs> We're not the only folks that do this. Um, but uh, what I think sets Swiftly apart is that we have the ability to improve data quality. Um, and while I'm more on the like transit nerd end of the spectrum of people here, this slide is for those on the more data nerd of the, at the end of the spectrum. Um, and so as, as we talked about, you know, those are the input, inputs on the, um, that come into Swiftly. But we have a number of tools that we do that improves the quality of the data that Thank you. That flows into the GTFSRT um, and that flows and in, informs our historical data. So some of these things that we do to improve data quality um, is we have the ability to actually make an assignment. Um, 
operators failing to actually log in is a far more common problem than many people might realize. And so there's agencies where maybe 10 or 20% of their data is missing because that assignment was never made. And so we have the ability to actually infer from the vehicle location and from the static GTFS um, where that you know, what trip that vehicle is on and make an assignment. We also use an interpolation method to determine arrivals and departures. Um, and we've done side-by-side -side comparisons and has shown this results in more accurate on-time performance reports that more accurately shows when the bus arrived and departed than people that use the geofence method. Um, we also have the ability to retain vehicle assignment. It often gets lost because of GPS outages. This is another thing that frequently impacts the quality of data that's flowing out of the GTFSRT, and we can adjust our parameters to retain those vehicle assignments. So in uh, dead zones, we're still putting out passenger predictions. This, of course, is uh, a little bit sacrifices some of the accuracy, a little bit of the quality, but it's better than just not showing any predictions at all. Um, and then we have the ability to pull in additional location feeds. So this provides greater data fidelity, and pulling in those additional feeds also adds a layer of resistance to the system that I'll get into in a bit. Um, and overall, we have better predictions, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, my job is to um, do is to assess the ROI for um, um, using our data. And so I'm going to talk about the uh, value of using Swiftly's real-time passenger predictions. So MBTA, who is here today, I'm not sure if any of you are in the audience, but um, they are a Swiftly, they work with Swiftly, and we were able to improve the accuracy of their rail predictions from 77% to 95% more accurate. Um, and this is because of our, uh, we believe that our algorithm is an industry best in accurate predictions. Um, this is a, st I like this agency. They're a smaller one, Pierce Transit in Tacoma, Washington. And same thing with MVTA. We were able to improve the accuracy of their predictions using, using our algorithm. But there's something else we did with them. And that is we were able to pull in an additional location feed. And that massively improved the GPS frequency that we were getting. And so that led to like an even additional bump in the accuracy of that real-time information as well as the accuracy of the historical information. Um, this next slide shows shows you just what that looks like. So the brown is what, that was the GPS pings we were getting from their current CAD EVL system, which we were using to pull in data. Um, and then the router was uh, an additional source of vehicle location data for us. And so uh, that is what led to like this tremendous improvement in data quality. Um, and just so you know, Swiftly has the ability to, to um, pull in feeds from the CAD EVL, but also from any source that um, has a GPS source. <laughs> This is why you know, many of those agencies that use Swiftly, they already have a CAD AVL system. So we're like, why are they buying Swiftly on top of it? It is because we are able to like, do these integrations and provide more accurate data. We also work with a number of agencies that decide they want to do away with a CAD AVL system entirely. And so Swiftly is able to just operate entirely on its own and use its cloud computing to provide all of the real-time and historical location data that an agency needs. So we do have some customers that they don't have a CAD EVL. They're, uh, Swiftly is their sole provider. Um, and so another way that we provide accurate GTFSRT information is through our service adjustments. I told you we're able to provide um, updates. And so this was a, this was a really funny um, ROI case is we were actually just testing out our service adjustments before we before, um, we released it widely, and Cap Metro was using it when they were suddenly hit by the biggest snowstorm in Texas history. And so they saw a very quick and very big ROI because one, they were able to just log in from the system from their home, um, which is something they weren't able to do with their other CAD EVL provider, and they were able to just cancel thousands of trips, close stops, adjust trip departure times over a period of three days, and they just honestly would not have been able to do this without Swiftly. Um, oh, and there was just one other thing I wanted to mention about, you know, when we talk about ROI, we talk about all these like numbers and improvements on data, but sometimes when you're working with small agencies, it can be like a really small benefit that makes a huge difference. So a smaller agency, Tahoe Transit, also uses our service adjustments, and a, the big value for them they also use it for snowstorms. They don't need to have a staff person going out and printing out stop close signs and driving all around in a snowstorm for a couple hours. So it saves their staff like you know hundreds of hours a year. Um, and that staff time savings is like very valuable and compelling enough for them to actually want to invest in better data. 
Um, and then finally, I want to talk about ROI from historical data. It came up, I believe, in the earlier talk from Joshua at MBTA. When I'm nervous, I talk fast. When I'm jet lagged, I talk slow. So I was hoping this would cancel <laughs> out. But, um, slow. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about how we can, uh, some of the ROI examples we have from leveraging historical data. And this came up in a previous session. Uh, Joshua from MBTA talked about, like, you know, GTFSRT is great for passengers and that real time information, but it's also great for capturing runtimes. And with GTFS GTFSRT, you have the ability to capture those runtimes and compare the observed on the ground runtimes with what was in the schedule. Um, and so this is one of the many examples of historical data that Swiftly has, that Swiftly shares with customers, and that they get a tremendous amount of value from. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of those use cases, maybe a little bit more slowly. <laughs> um, so this is a case from Olu in Finland. And so they did not have easy access to their runtimes data. Um, they were using anec anecdotal evidence to adjust their runtimes. This is more common than many people who aren't familiar with transit or familiar with transit agencies may realize. Um, but you know, I spend a lot of time talking to schedulers at all different agencies, and I'll pull up their runtimes data, and they're like, "Well, you know, I talked to the bus operator, and they said." that they need more time in the schedule. And I say, you know, has a bus operator ever told you they need less time in the schedule? Um, and so having access to this data is just a way to sort of like remove any kind of biases or subjectiveness to the process and just really root those conversations in the numbers. Um, and so Olu, by using their historic runtimes data, they were able to, we call it saving two buses, again, for those who maybe are not like transit nerds. Um, being able to like remove a bus from the schedule is kind of like the holy grail for scheduling and planning because it uh, results in like tremendous savings in operational cost. So they were able to actually remove two buses from their schedules. And um, they were also to show, they were also able to show significant improvements in their on-time performance, all just by having access to and accessible access to accurate data. There's other systems that maybe that data is in there, but it's not always as user friendly. Um, and making sure our data is very user friendly and easy to use is sort of like at the core of um, how we provide data and how we work with agencies. So with our runtimes, they can literally just put out an export and we'll do the math for them. We'll do like a statistical analysis and say, not only do we have all your runtimes, but we took a look at them and we're able to show you what we think would be the optimal runtimes for your system to save the most in operational costs. Um, SEPTA, they also used our runtimes and um, they were able to uh, remove you know, 16 minutes of slack or that extra time from their system. Um, the real value for runtimes for them was more in that like data accessibility. Uh, SAPTA is, they, they run a number of systems. They're a, PT, they're a private transit operator. And so they were actually able to use our data through APIs. And it just made the data like much more accessible, much easier to like commingle all that data, and easier for them to do these calculations. So it just saved them a tremendous amount of time to do the work to provide these optimal schedules. Um, and this is just a. I, I have like a million of these stories. So if anyone wants to come and talk to me, but you just, you know, here's just some more examples of like when people use Swiftly runtimes, they're able to save just significant amount of time out of their schedule and significant time in staff time in how and how long it takes to actually make these schedules. All through how we um, collect, analyze, and present our runtimes data. And this is just another example. Runtimes, um, I, that came, I focused on that because I think it sort of like resonates with a lot of the data discussions we were having here. But this is like a very simple tool that really just shows, it's a video that shows like the GPS pings of like where the vehicles traveled. And so a lot of times at an agency, they have to do these investigations to say where was the bus, there was a traffic incident, some customer called to complain the bus passed them by. And doing these, investigations are like extremely time intensive. And so by giving, by giving everyone at the agency access to this data, and maybe not just that one person who has the login, um, agencies are able to save like tremendous amounts of uh, staff time in, in doing investigations just by having access to historical information. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to 
<laughs> land on a question. Um, what happens when you provide accurate and accessible data to the hardest working people in transit? We have the fun job as planners. <laughs> the operators have the absolute hardest job in transit. And we are able to provide, it's like what happens when they have access to this information in real time? And so vehicles, again, for those who are more on the data nerd than transit nerd end of the spectrum, they have mobile data, uh, data terminals that show lots of information. We designed ours, it's just on a tablet. You can just buy it off the shelf and they're able to actually show what the schedule adherence is in a very clear, easy way to understand. Um, and so this like red circle here, that means, hey, you're running early. And so early's, by the way, are like the big no-no in transit. It's one thing for a bus to show up late, um, you know, by a couple minutes, you sip your coffee a little bit longer. But if you miss that bus by 30 seconds and the next one's not coming for 30 minutes, you know, that can make the difference of like losing your job if you're a transit dependent person. So reducing those early's is like a tremendous success story. And by giving those operators that information, they're able to make these micro adjustments. So when they're hitting maybe a yellow light, they'll stop instead of go. They'll ease up on the gas and reduce their speed. And so working with, this was, this number has come up multiple times. This was specifically from, on the next slide, I'll show you Comfort Del Grow. We worked with them and they saw a 37% reduction in those early departures and an overall 6% um, improvement in on-time performance. But we also worked with Tahoe Transit and same thing, we saw that 40% reduction in earlies when they had access to that onboard app. We worked with Santa Maria, uh, same thing, about a 40% reduction in earlies. And that um, having that like tablet does not only, we can not only adjust it to show schedule adherence, but we can adjust it to show headways. And so Cap Metro in Austin is also using it to reduce bunching and gapping on systems that they're running on headways. Um, and so with that, that is some examples of the ROI that agencies have been able to get from using, from having accessible, accurate data. Um, and now you all get to see how fun my job is. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it's very interesting to see how operational data is impacting traveler uh, in, a, in their day-to-day and -day their journey. Do we have some questions in the room? Hi, Lauren. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I fall somewhere in the middle of the transit nerd, data nerd spectrum, a uh, longtime transit user. And uh, I actually, I'm personally involved in coding pipelines that merge GTFS real-time and static schedules. And something that I've seen come up multiple times from Swiftly is the historic data. And I'm curious, um, once somebody signs on and they're interested in historic data, are, are you solely looking at the static GTFS data sets in the past? Or are you guys recording all GTFS real-time feeds all the time, hoping that somebody's going to call you up one day and ask for it? Or how, how do you, does the historical involve real-time? And if so, how do you go about collecting it? That's a great question. Um, it was never our intention to um, to collect data for every agency ever and like have these like historical data packages. Um, and so we don't do that by design. Um, but two things: once someone you know is a Swiftly customer, they do have access to that information. And so once we start collecting that data, it's there for them to access. That being said. Um, it, it's just, it's not a traditional process. So like there's agencies that like, we have a great relationship with, but they're not, they never signed a contract. They're actually not a Swiftly customer. They don't have access to our dashboard, but like we're still collecting their data because we're, we're talking to them. And so when that, if that day happens, um, and this has happened for a couple agencies, they're like, you know what, Swiftly, like we finally have this urgent need, we desperately need you. Sometimes we happen to have been collecting that data, um, but it has not gone through a data validation process. And so um, there's a discussion on like what, a whole discussion on whether or not they can access that data. But um, so that's a longer answer, because the short answer is no. We're not, we are not going, because there's, because there's massive issues with data validation, of course. But the longer answer is, is like, we have a bunch of dashboards, we have lots of great relationships, and if it comes up, then yeah, we actually might give someone some historical data access. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I call it data hoarding. Um, I, <laughs> I tend to, once a channel's open, just collect it all, and uh, the IT department doesn't always agree with it, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I, think it, I think there's a use to it there. Thank you. Hi. 
um, I saw a slide from uh, your presentation, and uh, we we have uh, we uh, uh, there there is different um, inputs. Okay, uh, as uh, GTFS static uh, location uh, buses, uh, and this input is connected to the swiftly. Okay, and is there if you want to generate a, a, a service change, for example, is there a human interaction to, uh, or you, 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 your software and to, uh, have an algorithm to, uh, to calculate that? It's, I, I wish it were quite that sophisticated. Um, a lot of... My, 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 it's simple. Is it uh, is there a human interaction? interaction no, the, the answer is the answer is there's not a human inter interaction, and I'll explain why. But it's not because of a magical algorithm. It rarely is. <laughs> um, it's because we do a really good job of um, having conversations with our customers at the very beginning of them joining the Swiftly party of um, how they need to handle their data. And one of those things is we say, you know, you need to have a uh, a URL where your GTFS lives. And when that gets updated, we just pull from that URL. It's that simple. But like, that doesn't happen organically. Like, we have that conversation and say, if you don't want you know, this to be a problem, the GTFS static needs a URL where it lives permanently. Does that answer your question? And, and just, I, I don't know if you're curious, but like, part of those conversations, um, just because it's just been a topic we've been talking about this whole the past two days is like we have extensive conversations around GTFS validation and like coaching them on like what their static GTFS needs to look like in order for us to provide an optimal GTFS RT feed. And it's great because they have this incentive. They want our data. They want to be able to access data and save a whole bunch of time and run times. And so we have not encountered um, many issues in coaching them on how to like make those changes in their, into their static GTFS because there is that incentive. Hi. Um, in some of the examples that you gave, you showed a sort of a, a dollar return on investment. And I was just wondering, for the um, superior predictions that you provide, if you have an indication from, from your customers of what that's worth to them? That is such a great question. Um, so what we, we, we have a conversation. I didn't put this in there because it's just like, it's not something you can easily quantify, but what we do is we'll ask them, you know, how many, how many passengers do you, do you have? How many of them do you think are looking at apps? Um, and then we make some extrapolations from there. We're like, well, um, if you didn't have these predictions, we think actually this many of your passengers would be missing the bus, this many of your passengers. And that does resonate with them. And sometimes, you know, we'll even like reduce those numbers by half just to, you know, try to make them as, um, just to make sure they're like comfortable with it. But in many cases, I can say, you know, your tens of thousands of people are not going to miss the bus because you have a 40% increase in prediction accuracy. But there's no standard way of doing it. <laughs> Um, hi. Um, fascinating talk. I'm wondering a bit more about uh, what changes to bus routes you actually made with the uh, with the data and how you were able to cut all these buses. Were these route level changes? I.e., were you changing routing, or were you just simply saying it's inefficient? It's stopping at the stop, you know, uh, for 30 seconds every time it runs uh, pointlessly. Sure. Another great question. Um, so, in the examples that I gave, they were not route changes. They were just, it was literally just extra time in the schedule. Um, and it's something that we're seeing more of over COVID. Um, some agencies just stopped, honestly, updating their schedule, didn't know how to handle it. So, there's a lot of slack. But we do have agencies that use our runtimes data for doing exactly what you're saying. SEPTA is using our runtimes for doing a bus network redesign. And so, because they have like those like segment level run times for different routes, they can kind of like take those pieces to make a new route. Of course, what they can't do is if we don't have, if a bus never ran a, a street segment, we don't have that data for it. Um, but it is something used, it's just not, not in the examples that I mentioned today. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Uh, we'll keep a Q&A section at the end also, if you have like questions for our two panelists. So let me move to the next section. What I wanted to um, share with you is I think the best way of summarizing my career is very early on. Um, it was location, location, location. Now, 
Then it evolved into developer, developer, developer. I just gave them the resources and the sugar and the coffee and let them do their job. And now, most recently, um, it's kind of evolved into data, 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 and data scientists, data scientists, data scientists. And um, with um, this first conference of mobility data, I think it's quite um, timing with regards to the transit industry. But early on, with the introduction of um, private mobility service providers, and a lot of the conferences and a lot of the um, conversations at, at transit tables, it was, oh my gosh, they are competition. They're going to steal away all of our ridership. And then everyone came to their senses that, no, this is going to solve the, right, the last mile problem. We need to partner. And then after that, at a lot of the conferences, it was focused on mobility as a service, applications. Let's put them all in an application. Let's integrate payment. Um, and then that evolved into policy and governance. And I am most excited about this, this episode um, of the focus on data. And so I think it's quite timing that, that you guys are having your first, <laughs> first international conference. Um, but go ahead, I'm here to talk about um, what we're currently doing at TriMet, um, the development of a smart mobility um, platform, and um, again, use cases and ROI. Go ahead. Um, and then a little bit about the background of this project. Um, we initially received a FTA Mod Sandbox grant um, application, and that actually took the Open Trip Planner um, and incorporated all private mobility service providers in it. So it's more comprehensive. With this grant, we're taking, um, we're building off of that platform to be much more comprehensive, not just for the purpose of uh, applications, but for the purpose of comprehensive um, analytics. Um, there's a third focus area in the IMI grant and that's specifically using mobility data to better assess and improve mobility management performance. Um, our key project partners for the entire project, the $2.7 million project, there's 19 um, partners. We're very proud to you know, have that um, strong and diverse of um, public-private um, relationships. Um, and for um, the, this particular focus area, focusing on the mobility platform, um, Fair and Peers um, is doing a lot of work in conjunction with IBI. IBI also worked with us on the initial mod grant. Um, Urban Logic, um, which is also here in the um, audience, and Data. Um, yes, hold on to your chairs. We're working with Uber. We have Uber Data. <laughs> We're also working with Lime and Waze as well. So. Go ahead. Um, so this first phase last year was exploration. And we focused on fair and peers developed mobility performance metrics and use cases by doing lots of interviews and workshops. Um, also working off of a lot of the documentation and research that the FTA did. Um, we did an RFP and Urban Logic was selected as our partner. They're also a Canadian company. Um, and we basically rolled it up into eight primary metrics um, categories. Now, we're currently, we just started the phase two demonstration phase, and um, we've developed already a pipeline, um, data pi pipelines into our platform, data management, data dashboards, and use cases for further data drill down. Um, just a couple drilling down into time, total journey time by mode, dwell times, accuracies, customer satisfaction, um, accessibility, um, drilling down to even you know, wait times for ADA transportation options. Um, and early on, you know, getting the Lime data and using Lime and scooter, um, transit and scooter um, information, it was kind of interesting. We, um, we condensed. Um, we weeded out several stops in our downtown areas, transit stops. And it's interesting, what we really wanted to focus on is how that shifted the e-scooter usage. Did e-scooter usage increase um, in that corridor? There's a lot of analysis out there that um, points to uh, 
there's not really a lot of scooter in transit use. Well, we, we want to prove that. And um, another example metrics um, we're doing, we have real-time information um, from our transit tracker. Um, and what we want to do is improve it using machine learning. And we've been building that model um, almost since the onset of the project, um, feeding in time deviations, um, traffic data, and weather. And the smart mobility platform bringing all of this in, it's basically a web-based tool where all of this can be visualized and explored through space and time along with a lot of other um, functionality. So the smart mobility platform, it was our requirement, actually TriMet's requirement for almost all acquisitions of systems that it be open architecture for interoperability, um, open data and open standards. We won't deviate from that. Um, not open source software. Um, a lot of people think, well, doesn't TriMet, isn't that a requirement? No, you focus on the requirements and you look at all alternatives, including open source alternatives, but you don't select solely on the fact that it's open source. Um, you focus on what system is going to meet all of your requirements. So the smart mobility platform, this is a very high level platform, but in addition to the analytics and the KPIs that we're doing, um, again, it's also supporting our mobility as a service app. Um, and there's other, there's new tools and applications that are coming out faster than we can keep track of. And we want to be able to select the best of the breed. So with regards to modeling tools, um, traffic occurrence, um, call taker, internal applications, modeling to tools, service planning apps. But with interoperability, we should be able to take one out, plug another one in um, with minimal, minimal work. Um, the data that we're bringing in is pretty extensive. Um, it goes beyond just basic transit, um, operational, and service data. Um, the metrics also goes beyond that to look at the region more holistically with regards to mobility. Um, our hop data, um, which is tap on, tap off, um, TSP and infrastructure data and information, NRIX, open weather, which we're use, using for the machine modeling. Um, of course, Uber, Lyft, Lime, um, national elevation data, data set, census, lots of other data, but these are the main ones. And most importantly, OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap is a seamless, routable network. It's, it's the basis of all systems um, within TriMet. Every system uses OpenStreetMap. And um, we actually have a part-time employee in maintaining it um, with a lot of infrastructure, a lot of information for the entire seven-county region. So here's an example of the dashboard, Urban Logic dashboard. Um, but um, there's metrics and um, also um, a map that is, of course, connected to it to allow, allow staff to really dive deeper. Um, and again, this is going beyond just your basic um, service performance NTD reporting. Um, it's, it's looking at things, again, much larger into this ecosystem. And first, I'm going to talk about um, the ODX analysis. So we are, of course, as most transit agencies, we have a tap-on um, system. So Urban Logic took that um, tap-on data, and they developed um, an ODX model um, pretty quickly, actually. And it provides TriMet with new insights into a lot of information besides travel behavior. And um, what we're beginning to see and use, it's, it's beyond our expectations. Um, the first use uh, and the deadline for this was actually for um, developing our TriMet's comprehensive service plan. And in this instance, um, they were studying line 35. And it deviates to create transfer opportunities in St. John's. But when we looked at the O&D data, only 1% of line 35 transfers were happening there. So it resulted in a proposed um, redesign of that speeded up trips. And um, the planners estimate you know, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in um, annual service costs. Um, another one for the comprehensive service plan, looking at line 71 and 72. This was based on OD patterns um, and census. 
And we're now proposing to combine two lines into a single route after analyzing this information um, that will give people in the um, underprivileged um, Cauley neighborhood um, kind of a one seat ride and faster service to their jobs. ODX analysis, mode comparisons. Um, this is a study of OND data to and from um, transit centers comparing Lyft, Uber, and transit data. And when I saw this, I wanted to go up and touch the screen for the first time. <laughs> I was so excited, but go ahead. <laughs> Um, so this is looking at line data, and um, what you see in the um, red is the um, Park Row Sumner Transit stop. And what you see in green is all the origins of line data um, of line scooters that are going to that um, transit center um, as their destination. This is the same thing for Uber trips. All of the Uber trips that are traveling to, and you could see the difference between, um, there's a very stark difference between these. Um, go ahead. And then in comparison, this is transit data, and it's just the opposite looking at it. In green is the destination of where the transit um, trips start, and in red is where those destinations of those trips end. So that's pretty compelling, and I think this also demonstrates you know, the second, this is basically showing the second leg. Lime and Data and Lime and Uber are the first leg of these trips, and this is um, you know, looking at the, the second leg of that. And we're just beginning to um, look at this. You know, I can't really talk about the analytics and the findings. I mean, this is literally new. So um, here's something that's interesting for marketing and business development. Um, Lonnie, who's the director of this, this group, you know, he, he called me and he's like, you didn't tell me you were doing this, I need this data. And, um, but his use cases were very prof profound. I'm like, how did we miss this? How did we miss this? So we're incorporating that in no scope creep. And um, so, um, but this is kind of an example um, and I wonder, you know, how we would do it differently in our process. The first year, it was really studying use cases. And now that we have the data and we're looking at it, a lot of those use cases we've thrown out the window and new, new use cases are popping up all over the place. So, and it, I think that that has to do with, this is the first time that people are really looking beyond transit and um, it's really exploratory um, for them. And this is using um, our multimodal data. So our trip planner, our multimodal trip planner, we have different versions um, that are out there. But being able to study mode usage, transfers, travel patterns, and ride incentives with this data and information. Now, of course, using trip planning data, you don't really know um, if they're taking the trip or not. But what we are looking at is trends. And we're also comparing this and validating this against other data sets. So I just want to say the benefits of multimodal trip planning. Um, it is much more powerful. And I remember when I first planned this trip, this example on the right-hand side going from the airport, it literally cut my cost down in half from taking Uber alone and taking, my taking the time down by half as well. Um, and in my mind, this is an inherent requirement for any MOS, any mobility as a service application. So this is pretty interesting. This is looking at the data over a five month time period, um, comparing on the, on the top, those are transit only trips and the requests that were made. And at the bottom, the, um, the transit plus the multimodal trips that are there. And what's interesting, what's exciting about this is if you look at some of the drastic changes in the data, because we have comprehensive data sets where we don't have to go data mining and doing a lot of analysis, we've got it all there. So we could very quickly and easily look what happened there, just like in the stock market. What caused that drop? And you know, what incentives can we provide 
um, to you know, increase usage of this. Um, impact and ROI on this. Um, again, it's really hard to grab um, numbers. Um, I'm sure a lot of you in the transit industry working for agencies, it, it's very hard, um, and especially early on. Um, but again, um, better customer information, better decision making, better seamless, affordable, safe, door-to-door -door transportation options for our customers, again, being very customer focused, um, stronger public-private partnerships, and data sharing, hint, 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 hint. Um, stronger public-private partnerships, oh, sorry, improved collaboration between business units. And what's interesting is um, in TriMet, all the business units, you know, planning kind of works separately from operations and from dispatch. And you have technology even. You have all these disparate um, people and um, business units. And what we're finding is that if you bring data together, you're also bringing people together. And they're solving problems together and they're <coughs> learning and understanding about the impacts that they have on each other and really sitting down at the table and working together, collaborating, which is great to see. So I wanna leave you with this slide, you know, the future of the smart mobility platform, the future of transportation and mobility. Um, right now in transit agencies, you'll see a dispatch um, center um, that looks something like this. However, all you see on there are buses and trains. So with this kind of a platform, you're able to pull all this other information in. Um, all of the private mobility providers, all of the infrastructures, you're able to do analysis um, on emergency management, um, what impacts certainly, what impacts, you know, might, uh, what might impact certain things in certain areas in your region, and then also just to better, you know, manage a comprehensive um, travel system beyond just um, buses and trains. That's where we're headed. You know, what does it look like under the hood of a transit agency in five to ten years? And I think that, that um, the smart mobility platform is a really good start for that. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you have so much data. <laughs> Do you ever run into issues where um, the data like contradicts each other? You're not sure like who you should be listening to. What data, you know, what data is have higher quality? Um, yes, and that's why we're doing um, a lot of cross-reference QC validation. Um, but I think having um, a platform like this really addresses it. If service planning has their own analytics on their own data and um, operation scheduling has their own, you know, who's right. But having all that information comprehensively and validated together, together in one platform, you know, it also um, increases confidence um, by the users in the data. Okay, so I have a question. I think we all agree that we have the traveler in mind, in our heart when we work, in our day to day, but now we're speaking about money. Um, how much do you have your traveler in mind when you're working, uh, for example, with your clients or uh, with the smart mobility platform versus money saving? Two answers. Um, for the, the definition of like what is successful ROI is defined by the agency when I'm having those conversations. So like I said, if, if for them, saving a bunch of time and stress from driving around Tahoe and posting signs is the value, then that's the value. Um, but as a planner, of course, the rider is always at the forefront of my mind. And so um, this was sort of central to that question that I received earlier is we do do a lot of education sometimes to like uh, bring bring staff along to, to get them to actually understand how the rider is impacted by this. Um, you're working with so many different people at an agency that not every one of them will understand that. So I try to bring that into the conversation when I can. I think our measure of success, again, um, the FTA, I think it's amazing for them to give out so many grants dedicated to um, innovations in technology and transportation. 
Um, we have, again, the exploration and the demonstration phase, and I think um, um, success means where people can't live without it. <laughs> and we're going to continue this and put it into our budget um, to, to continue growing and actually share it with our other regional data partners as well. So what is missing right now in GTFS and GBFS to make your return on investment even better? Like, what's the, what's the next step? Uh, detour shapes. <laughs> I'll make sure my team knows that. <laughs> um, for us, it's really we've been waiting for um, GTFS fares version 2.0. And um, also GTFS Flex. So we're expanding regionally and incorporating in a lot of the urban um, rural areas, I'm sorry, the rural areas, um, they uh, service shuttles, they manage shuttles. So bringing the shuttles in um, is going to require the GTFS flex and then bringing in the other agencies. It sounds very easy, I'll just you know, add in, you know, CTRAN. Um, there's a lot of a lot that goes on to that. It's it's a huge project, and um, we can't do that without fair, um, without the fair spec and um, that rec reconciliation. Any other question? I have another one. I keep on going. All right. Well, I think I have to ask because you're on stage with us, uh, Viviana. Um, so, given all the time you spent and invested in uh, drafting GTFS. Are you proud to see where it is right now? And my follow-up question, where would you like to see it go with, if there's no limitation? It's, it's amazing to see how far it's come. And um, a little bit of trivia, when we first worked with Google um, and gave them the data, it's actually a, originally an export of our database schema and CSV file format, and to this day, it's very similar to our schema. Um, and working with Google Transit on the first release, um, you know, they termed it Google Transit Feed Spec. And, you know, we were like, no, 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 this isn't about Google. This is about something, you know, much, much more. Um, another piece of trivia I might add at that time, I held a workshop before this, and I'm like, we need a standard. We need a standard. Let's work together, and the other agencies weren't work. work if Google wants my data, they're going to have to pay for it, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I won't name his name, but one of my colleagues from King County Metro, you know, that was the last thing he said to me. And then Sunday night, he calls me up and he said, I have a meeting with our GM at 8 a.m. and he wants to be next on Google Transit. So <laughs> it kind of took... Um, you know, a while to bring people around, but what I'm most excited about, you know, things moving along is the innovation of technology and um, applications and the many uses, you know, of it that it provides. And if you see, um, you know, through time, um, all of the applications kind of um, just preceded um, the new specs that are coming out. So, like, we wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to um, do the Mod Sandbox grant um, and bring in the other service providers without MDS and GBFS, so. And where, where do you like to see it go with no limitation? And I have the same question for you, Lauren, after. With what? Where, where, do you want, where do you want to see standards with no limitation? Helping Elon Musk get, getting us to Mars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We should host a session about that last <laughs> next year. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. It was a great discussion. I really enjoy speaking with the two of you. Thanks, everyone, for your question. Again, we're uh, staying around if you have anything else you want to share. Um, thanks. I don't know what time it is, um, but thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> what time is